Your product is your people. People know if you care. Are your coaches showing that they actually care about people and making people feel cared for when they walk through the door? Are you just providing a workout? Because if you're $150, $200 a month, and you're just providing a workout. Well, anyone can do that. So being real, is your product where it needs to be? Leadership is everything. It doesn't matter any of these systems. If we put them into a gym where the owner was not all in on their business as an operator, or they didn't have a manager that's all in as an operator, they're all worthless. Like you need to have the right people in there and culture is a huge part of it. Welcome to the Fitness Empire Podcast, where we show gym owners how to dominate their competition and build a massively profitable fitness business. Dustin and Matt collectively own 12 gyms and have a combined 30 years of experience in the fitness industry. They're here to help gym owners create an empire of impact and income. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Fitness Empire Podcast. Matt and I have missed you guys. We've been off a couple weeks, and uh, we just wanted to spend more family time. If you haven't heard, Matt welcomed a new kiddo to the world, little Isabella, so we're excited for him. And then for me, I was just enjoying more family time, my kiddos for the holidays. We figured you guys probably wouldn't miss us because hopefully you were spending more time with your family. But that doesn't mean we weren't working and grinding and getting ready for 2024. So we are back and ready to attack the year. And so I wanted to actually start off with a gift to you guys to the fitness industry. And that is something that me and Matt put together because we really enjoy coaching owners one-to-one -one and going deep into their business and looking at how things are and looking for opportunities. So we put together a special program where you can pretty much get a free gym audit. I, it is a dollar. But you can get a gym audit where we will get on the phone with you one-to-one. -one. We're going to go over three main sections of your business that really are going to expand throughout the year and create a bigger business, or they're going to stay in the same place and you're going to have the same business at the, end of, at the end of the year. So it's basically just a standard gym audit, we call it. So you can go to gymaudit.com and you can get on the phone with Matt one-to-one. -one. And essentially it is a dollar to reserve. And that is because obviously we want to protect that you're going to show up and you're not going to take advantage of his time. And if you no show, Hey, we just want you to know the penalty. It's a hundred dollars if you no show. So just don't waste this time. If you're really you know, interested in this being, you know, something that you're going to use and take advantage of, then, then book it and show up again, that's gymaudit.com. Um, and we'll talk about that more later on, Matt, but I'm going to have us get right into the topic. So today is actually kind of like a gym audit, but it is a real life example. It is a gym that I got partnered into and I really wasn't expecting. It's kind of an opportunity that came out of left field. But now that I've been doing it, I, I don't like to speak until I have actual experience and results and data. We've been in it over 13 months and we took it from negative 10,000 a month to positive 6,000 a month. And so obviously for confidentiality reasons, I can't share the name of the gym and all that, but I can pretty much give you guys a sneak peek behind the curtain and that way you can apply it to your business too. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And then um, I'm gonna just go kind of section by section that we kind of, you know, quote unquote rehabbed. And then if you guys see how this can apply to your business, that's the point of the episode. And, you know, that's the win that I'm shooting for. So essentially, just to give you a little backstory, the owner knew that this is what I do. I, you know, I'm in the fitness industry. He kind of came into the fitness industry, not from the fitness industry. He bought into a gym and realized this thing needs a lot more attention than I thought I was going to give it. He, he kind of intended to give it side hustle effort. I'm going to run my main business and hey, you know, maybe I'll open a gym for fun and said, holy crap, what have I gotten myself into? And so he just called me up. And so we have a relationship and I decided to help him out. So this is kind of the step-by-step -step process. And, you know, it's one of those things where Sometimes you just know something so well, you don't even know your process. And so I actually, in preparation of this episode, wrote everything down. But like, I just went in, I was just me. I was just like, if I owned a gym, this is what I would do. I would do this, this, and this. And that's just 12 years of experience. But I wanted to put it down in a step-by-step -step process for you guys. And just for my own review of what exactly did I do section by section. So we're going to cover 
the coaching department and just like the delivery of service, marketing, sales, leadership, a lot of different sections. And then what you guys could do is just say, okay, how does this apply to my business? Are we good here? Are we strong? And we can, you know, think about another section or do I need to stop and I need to fix things here? So essentially that is what we're going to cover. And just so you guys kind of know where the EFT started, it was at uh, 18,000 a month, which is not terrible, but their rent was almost 10 K. So they were operating at a, a negative 10 K a month was their worst month. But essentially they then grew to 35,000, uh, in EFT. So that is uh, a pretty significant growth. And so I'm going to talk about what exactly we did to get there, to go from 18,000 to 35,000. And we got there in less than a year for most owners, they'd be really happy to see that. So what would that do for your business? If you grew by, I mean, we're talking uh, 19,000 gain in, in revenue is what I ended up seeing as the total. So what would that do for your business? At the end of the year, you were bringing in 19,000 more a month. So that's what we're going to dive into and talk about. All right. So I'm going to kick us off with some red flags. And then, um, Matt, just because I know you audit a lot of gyms and you talk to a lot of gyms, I'd be interested to hear what kind of red flags you see in businesses. But basically this is what i saw um so first we, we wanted to obviously the coaches see the coaches in session and and by the way like i i can see that easily because somebody can just send me video footage and i can say i need footage of every coach in action seeing what they do and so first thing hey, I dustin saw, oh, yeah. dustin real real quick i think the listeners maybe they know but they don't know but like they need to realize like you're distant in this like you didn't go into the gym and take over and you're running the gym and uh, and doing all the 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 day to day operations, right? So, even yeah. when you hear that awesome number that he talked about, realize, you know, obviously if Dustin were to go in there and be, you know, be willing to go in the trenches and do the work, maybe it would have happened a, a lot quicker. Um, but also, he's a distant. He, he's doing this from a distance. So when you guys hear what he's talking about, just realize that it's a little bit different than you being in your gym. Um, or are you taking over somebody else's gym and, and you're being involved? So uh, look through that. Yeah. So like, thank you, because that's a good point. Everyone will put up their blockers and they might think, well, that, you know, you're able to help them because you physically walked in. Nope. I can totally help you guys right now through this podcast. And that's the point. So, um, you know, first thing is we got to look at the product because that's what we're selling. And the product's no good. That was the first thing I looked at. I was like, I need to see these sessions and, and I need footage. And so one of the things that I noticed was I jokingly called it, but I said, the coaches got cement shoes, which meant that they just, they stayed still the whole session, like literally like somebody glued their feet to the ground and there was no dynamic movement. There was no walking around, checking people's form. And this is a large group program and large group program needs high energy. It needs movement. It needs the, the coach burning a, a hole in the floor because they're marching through it quickly and getting around to people and creating, you know, that energetic feeling. And so I get it. it. It could be tired in the morning, you know, if you're staying late and you're coming back and doing like a double, you know, kind of uh, shift, like, but you got to bring the energy, you got to turn it on. And so they, they just did not have that. It was very dull energy coaching. They also were very distant from the clients. And this was many years after COVID. So there's no reason that anybody needs to be distant, but they were very, very far away they were almost treating the clients like they had some sort of disease and they weren't able to touch them. And that was definitely another thing I saw was zero hands-on coaching. And I know that that's for some people very uncomfortable. They don't like it. They feel like they're getting in their space. But I think if you talk to most good trainers, they, they all get hands-on with their clients. You know, you do it with a place of love or, you know, like healing. I call like the doctor has the healing touch. A trainer should have the healing touch. Like I'm coming to just you know, be very professional and fix your form. And I'm not trying to do anything other than that. And so, um, that was another thing I noticed, no hands-on corrections, staying far away from the clients, creating this big gap. And that doesn't create any sense of community or that my coach is ever like, what if I'm doing things wrong? Like I would wonder, is the coach ever going to come fix it at that location? No, at most, they might just shout out a verbal cue. And then the other thing was a red flag was every day was hit and, and hit training has its place, but we know the science shows we need some strength training. We, we need that to be the primary style of training and that hit 
is supplemental. And so they were just doing six days of hit. There was no dedicated strength day. And so that is going to eventually lead to the clients getting those initial gains, but then they're going to drop off over time. So we needed to implement that as well. Um, next red flag was there was no all in leader. It was basically all coaches. And so there was no leader. There was no decision maker. There was nobody that they knew. No one knew who was in charge. Obviously that's going to create chaos. And I definitely saw a split in terms of like the, the team mindset, like nobody really was there to help each other out and to have each other's back. In fact, the morning coach wrote their own workout programming and the evening coach wrote completely separate programming. And obviously you guys can see the car wreck in that if the evening coach wrote a leg workout and then the morning coach writes um, a leg workout the next day, there's no programming calendar we're working off of. It's kind of just a hot mess. And that was definitely a red flag. They had very low trial sales. So they were getting 10 or less trials in a month and they were having a fair amount of non-starters, which are people who buy a trial and then they don't even redeem it and never even come in. And there wasn't really anybody reaching out to them to get them activated. There was no high quality onboarding. And then finally, from talking to, again, the team, the majority of the clients were just OGs. And every gym has this. You guys probably know as gym owners, you got your OGs, the original gangsters that came with you when you opened the gym, and they are there with you throughout the years. But if you really just depend on them, you never master the art of getting new people in to fall in love with the gym, just like the OGs, you're kind of stuck forever in the same EFT land. And so they were never really able to get new people to come in and become fans of the business. They kind of just had their core hundred that were just there and, and they were there for years and there wasn't really any new people staying on. So again, conversions weren't so hot either. That's the, the red flags that I initially saw. And, you know, those were the things that I made notes of that obviously we got to attack these things. Matt, when you're talking to gyms, are there any red flags that you see that kind of stand out? Well, I mean, if you're if you're marketing and your trial conversions aren't working very well, so you're not getting a lot of trials, you're not getting a lot of trial conversion. Obviously, we can look at, hey, what is the marketing? But if we're doing marketing and you're still not getting the, the trials you need and people aren't converting, then you have a product problem. Right, it's it's very clear that you have a product problem. Obviously, too, with attrition, all the three big three. So, if you recall us talking about the the big three, then that's really what I, I cover in the audit. Is all right. How are we getting trials? How many trials are we getting? Right. What's your plan for trials? And then ultimately, when we do get the trials, what percentage of those are we converting? What's our process look like to get somebody to become a member? And then ultimately, how many people are we losing every single month? Because if you want to change your business, it's changing those three metrics, right? And oftentimes when I do an audit, it's very glaring on where where do things need to be fixed. And it's actually pretty easy to fix because obviously we've been in the industry for for so long. But the starts with the product. And I always say that it's like if you want marketing to be more effective, have a great product that that people want. And that starts with your your coaches. We're in the training business. It's all about how do we make people feel when they walk through our doors. If you're doing large group training, pretty much the entire game is high energy coaching sessions designed to make people feel good. So when you're inside of your business, often, or maybe you're a distant owner, you don't realize what the product actually is. One of the best things that you can do is, is get a client survey to, to your members. So if you have a very specific of like, this is how we want our sessions run, and this is the experience we're trying to do, you can actually have your clients like rate your coaches on the experience that they're providing. For example, like if you want your coaches to use people's names, which hopefully you guys are doing, um, like on a scale of one to five, like five being always, does this coach use your name in in the sessions, right? Because again, if you're not there, you're not present. And a great example of this was even inside of my business, one of our locations, the location wasn't growing. Uh, we were starting to get higher levels of attrition so we did a, a client survey and the person that was the leader of that location, he was like, yeah, clients love the work because he he kind of wanted to do his thing and his approach and add his his style to the workouts. And he's like, yeah, the clients love them and they're always saying how awesome it is. We got a client survey and 200 clients said that they hate the design of the workouts. So this person... He's biased in his opinion because it was his style and his way of doing things and he thought everybody was bought into it uh, because he was 
selectively listening to what he wanted to listen to, the one or two clients, or he would ask them and they would lie to his face, right? But then when we actually got a survey, everything he was telling us was wrong, yeah. right? So the product wasn't what he thought it was. And obviously the product wasn't what we thought it was either. So then we made those changes and then obviously things turned around. But because I'm not a present owner, I'm not in the locations, I was taking that person's word for what was happening and it was not what the clients were saying. So I'm a big believer in twice a year doing client client surveys and also getting the surveys back on your coaches based on like what are your guys' standards in your location? Like uh, for a large group, we have on the mic and off the mic standards. For small group, we have certain standards that we have what our coach, we want our coaches doing. And yes, like their supervisor, their manager, their leader should be auditing that themselves. But the best way to audit is the people that are actually receiving it because they're going to be the ones that are going to go tell the marketplace that this place is awesome. And if you have raving fans, that this place is awesome, or let's just say you have a challenge that truly gets people results. And when it's time for challenge time, they're going to go tell everybody, hey, you need to come here, right? So it amplifies your marketing massively, but your product is your people, right? How do they make people feel? And if they're not bought in, then your your clients, like people know if you care, right? So like, are your coaches showing that they actually care about people and making people feel cared for when they walk through the door, you're just providing a workout. Because if you're $150, $200 a month and you're just providing a workout, well, anyone can do that. You can go to the YMCA or the the local big box gym that offers a class and pay a fraction of what they pay, right? So being yeah. real, is your product where it needs to be? And obviously in Dustin's situation, have a owner that's not in the fitness industry, probably doesn't even know what a good product looks like because a lot of franchises and a lot of people are like, hey, just hire a certified coach and you're good to go. They A certified coach doesn't know how to provide a high energy coaching session designed to make people feel good, right? So start there. Open and honest, like, is my product where it needs to be? And if it's not, then spending the time, energy, and effort to make sure that the product's where it's need to be. And, and oftentimes, especially if we start burning out and our give a shit factor starts going away. It's out of sight, out of mind. And yeah. we're like, I, I'm going to go find the new marketing play or the new whatever play. And that's going to be the thing that changes my business. No, it won't. Because the best marketing play is word of mouth, that you have a great product. You have a team that, that cares about people. You have a product that makes people want to come back. Start there with whatever you are doing inside of your business. And it amplifies everything else. You cannot outmarket a crappy product. You cannot outsell a crappy product, right? Like you just can't. So start there. And if you're you're struggling and you want outside eyes, like recruit, like like Dustin said, take a video and send it to somebody else. Like I would be willing to pay somebody else. Like ideal world, you pay me or Dustin to watch a video and we give you feedback, mm -hmm. right? On how good is this product? I'm not doing it. Maybe Dustin will, but I'm not doing it. But because I can't watch people suck. So it, that's just a challenge for me. But get some honest, open feedback. Like if you're in a network of gyms or you know some gym owners that have a very successful whatever product that you provide, recruit them to watch the video and give you open and honest feedback on your products. Love it. You know, and the people that have changed their gyms around, oftentimes it's having to change their product, which means changing their coaches uh, to be able to have the the level of product that it should be. Yes, because that's what I found. And, and then, you know, that kind of goes back to what you alluded to. And we're going to talk about this when I get to leadership, but it's dealing with smooth talkers. And smooth talkers are people that are really good at selling themselves or what they're doing. And you got to learn to read through people's BS because if people are good with words, they can sell ice to an Eskimo. And so you got to just learn to read through their beliefs, their words, their, you know, kind of promises and just say, I kind of have to disagree with you because the numbers tell me something different, right? And to your point, people will bring you skewed data. They'll say everybody loves it, but it, it talked to 20 people that are their raving fans. They didn't talk to the 80 people that are on the MIA list and not coming in because they don't like their sessions. So 
we have to go where the data tells us and, and the feedback because the clients at the end of the day have the biggest voting power because they give us their dollars. I'm going to get into what we changed with our coaching product real quick. I'm going to just hit what was good because I don't want to just beat up this gym and say everything sucked. There was good things. They didn't do a good job with their build out. It was beautiful. It, it had a really nice feel to it. When you walked in, it really was well done. Um, there was plenty of space. It wasn't crammed. There was lots of parking. So that got me excited because that meant that there was a, a, a big opportunity for lots of growth. And then they ha they were in a great location. I looked in on the map, high income area, and essentially they can crush it because there was also no competition. There wasn't really someone in the same business model as them. And I don't know if the listeners that have observed this, I have too, there's been less and less gyms opening. And so that's good news for gym owners because you got less competition. I mean, you just rewind back to 2017, 2018, and I felt like there was a gym coming into our town every three months. And so you might have thought this is how it'll be forever. Well, COVID put a hard stop on that because the cost of commercial lease space has gone up. Um, the cost of goods has gone up. So it's raised the bar for someone who wants to open a gym. And so again, for you, if you're established, like competition is going to be much lower. And then the other thing was the clients were very, very like, great community and they were hungry for something new and hungry for challenges and hungry for a lot of things they were not currently doing. They didn't really do any of the fun things that we ended up implementing. They didn't do challenges, any member engagement stuff. They ate it up. And so they did have a good, great uh, group of OG members. And then the other thing is on their marketing, they did get low cost per lead, uh, you know, usually around 10 or $12. And this was to a page pointing people to join a trial or a challenge. This was even like just a giveaway or an opt-in or a lead magnet. So those were all the pluses from marketing to potential growth to, you know, uh, um, culture. Like these were all good things that the location had. It just needed more vision and business systems implemented. And that's how we, you know, kind of got going. So I'm going to go over the coaching product first, because like, you know, Matt brought it up. It definitely is the, the foundation. It's the cement in which the business grows on. If you guys open a gym as a trainer, you were that product, you were the cement. And then we added on coaches from there and it built up. And so we have to go back to that way of thinking like day one coach opening a gym. What is the thing that gets people to come in? It's the coaching product. So First thing is we had people get in, up in people's grill a lot more and do hands-on correction and get close to them and look at them in the eye and, you know, shake their hand when they're coming in and fix their form when they're training and just making everybody know this is a place where we will touch you correctively, pro pro uh, professionally, and it's because we care about you. And the clients really loved it. Like they were, they were very, you know, open to it. But again, you don't want to just start doing this out of the blue when they've been trained for years that the coaches don't do this. You want to announce it and why it's a win for the client. So we said, we are going to start doing this because we got trained on it and we're excited because it means you guys are going to get better uh, form and better results. Your injuries are going to go down and we just want to give you a heads up. And if anybody's not comfortable, let us know. We won't come and do it. So if you're not doing it, you can wrap it up into a big announcement. And that way, everybody's clear. Again, one of the things that I love that Matt always references is the frustration gap. People get frustrated when you when their expectations don't match reality. And so if I expect it day in and day out, you don't come over here and tech, you know, touch me to fix my form. And then you know, reality is you start getting in my grill and touching my hips and moving my shoulders and all that. I'm going to be frustrated. Like, what the heck? This is not what we agreed on. So get ahead of that set expectations. Um, in terms of programming, we had dedicated strength days and then cardio days and that immediately clients that have been there for a while started progressing more and getting better results. And that was definitely an easy win, you know, because you guys are smart, you know, programmers, you know why synced up programming. Obviously we got rid of the AM and PM coach doing their own thing. Everyone's running the same workout all day long, easy win. Um, we had to cut a coach. Unfortunately, I, I wouldn't even give them that name. My silly name for these people, I call them a fitness gypsy. And so they're usually more of a fitness instructor and they jump from gym to gym throughout the day. They go to three different gyms. They don't really have a home gym. That's why I call them a gypsy and they kind of get these, you know, like per session payouts. So they'll go run a, uh, Les Mills, you know, like body pump at this gym and then they'll go run zoom over here and then they'll do go do cycling over there. And then they might come to this gym that, you know, used to have them on the team and run a boot camp. 
And so they're kind of just hustlers. They're out just trying to make a quick payday. They don't really want to be W-2. They kind of want to be 1099 and bouncing around. That's not going to work. We need people completely dedicated to our clients, our business, focused on it. And so we cut the fitness gypsy. We brought in a dedicated coach, and that was a game changer for culture. Also, when we had that gypsy, nobody could have required them for coverage, and and they couldn't depend on them because they were flown around to four other gyms. So then that was a big win, was just restructuring the team and bringing on a dedicated coach. We did start the first month to set the client expectation that we're going to either have some sort of member engagement like contest or a challenge every single month. So that way they never get bored. They're always looking forward to things every month. And so we started really easy with low hanging fruit. I, I come up with this little silly idea called hanging at the bar. And so we know people go do that at a drinking bar. This is where you have them literally dead hang on a rig and you increase the time that they're doing it each week. And if they can complete the challenge, they get thrown into a raffle to win a gift card. And people were digging it. They're loving it. After the sessions, everyone's hanging on the bar. It's 15 seconds. The next week, it's 30. The next week, it's 45. It's just a little extra contest. It gets everyone laughing, gets everyone together at the end of the session. And that was a huge hit. And then we continued with a New Year challenge and you know, on and on and on. And that was a big, big thing that they loved. That again, no one was really creating any fun or excitement. It was come in, work out, leave. We needed to get the members engaged and start to create community. We also hacked the session schedule. So they were running 13 sessions a day and they were only north of about 100 to 120 members. It wasn't a lot of people. So very thin session attendance because it's too many sessions for that amount of members. So we cut it from 13 to seven sessions a day. They had a noon session. That session had to go. They had like six morning sessions and four evenings. It was just too many. And so we had to just start cutting away and, and reducing that. That was that. A couple other things. We put in our announcements to always have a call to action. The, the coaches really weren't doing an announcement. They were kind of just taking people through a really awkward stretch where they would tell you to do a stretch and then they would just go silent for 30 seconds and then they'd tell you to do another stretch and they go silent. There's just like no talking. It was really awkward. It was just like not a high energy way to end a session. So we taught them to do end of session announcements, tell them what's going on in the gym and every day have some sort of call to action. It could be to join a member challenge, to um, book their next session, to buy supplements, but like we want to be talking to them when we have their ears, right? And so that was another uh, thing that we implemented. And then to, to kind of like help that, we also put easy QR codes. So whatever that week's call to action was, there was just a simple QR code to make their life easy. If the, you make a lot of steps or a lot of friction, and those are all just easy, low-hanging fruit that we can do. Finally, to make the coaching product better, we put in three layers of accountability. So the, the three layers are same day no shows if somebody books an 8 a.m and doesn't show up they get a text that same day and so the am coach is responsible for owning the the people who don't show in the morning block and the evening coach does the same with the evening block but people started to notice like holy cow we've never been called out before for booking a no-show and i could just book and who cares no one's going to notice now they started getting called out accountability actually started being a real word and they loved it. And so people even started messaging, hey, I saw it and I know I booked for 9 a.m., but just so you know, I'm not going to be there. And so like, we want that. We want people to know they will be getting called out if they don't show. So same day no shows level one. Then we have our MIA list is level two. And so that's someone who hasn't been around for our one to two weeks, seven to 14 days. We tag them as an MIA client, missing in action. And so people should not be gone that long because they're starting to slip back into an old habit. When Once you stop going to the gym for a week or two, that starts to become normal. And so get a hold of these people. Now the coach needs to elevate it out of texting into calls and DMing them on Facebook. So we just add more layers of communication because they, if they haven't been replying to our text from week one, that has shown to be ineffective. So we got to try other communication channels, right? Finally, the third level is like the highest red alert, like DEF CON 2 type of thing. It's it's at risk client list. And this is somebody who has not been in the gym 21 plus days. And so basically the, the general manager needs to step in. They need to send a handwritten note. They need to send a video message, like other forms of communication and more volume until we get a hold of this person. And we want to ask people in this gym 
Does anybody else know this client? Who's friends with this client? Who else can we get a hold of? Ask, talk to somebody that is outside of uh, maybe even the gym, their their spouse, but like message someone else to get a hold of that person because we want them to know this is like critical uh, issue. And so this is good for you guys to know because it also gives you your utilization rate, which means the percentage of clients that are actually coming in and attending monthly. And you want to know your utilization rate. Like, are you having 90% use at least come in one time a month and then 10% are just completely MIA for the entire month. You have a 90% utilization rate. So like how many people are using your membership? We don't want to be like the big planet fitness and all these gyms that want 80% non-utilization. We want to be the opposite, right? And so that is what you get when you track these things. So these were a few things we did to kind of rehab the coaching product. And essentially the coaches were very open to it again, besides the one we had to cart part ways with the other two were like, finally some leadership, some, some systems, some like, you know, cohesiveness, like everybody getting on the same page. And so that doesn't always happen. I, I do want to say like, I have sold gyms, I've, you know, I've, I've helped owners rehab their gym. And essentially like sometimes when a new owner comes in or new management, like the old team goes because they're not on board with the way things are changing and they want to kind of live in the past and they want to stay true to the old way of doing things. But if the old way was not getting us anywhere, we have to change it, right? It's time to pivot. And so they, they had a good couple years of running those systems and they weren't really growing anywhere past 120 members. So it's like, how long do we want to keep this up guys? Like we got to pivot. So that's a list of everything we did to rehab the coaching product. And I'll, I'll say the final thing was putting in regular, product reviews like Matt was bringing up like hey we fixed it one day what stops it from breaking down again and so putting in quarterly game film reviews the the GM or owner has to watch their sessions whether it's live or video footage and you have to you know inspect what you expect if you just fix it once people can start just dropping off and slacking over time and then that happens so you got to put that backup plan in place Matt anything else you would add on coaching product I think when you first look to to make a massive change in your product, uh, I just want to echo a few things that Dustin said because I think it's really important uh, because sometimes we just make changes and then hope for the best. Uh, but you do have to communicate those changes to to your members of here's what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is how it benefits you. It still blows my mind how many gym owners will talk about how it benefits the gym. And it's like you never talk to a client about how something benefits your gym. <laughs> It needs to benefit them, right? So making sure that if you're adding strength days, how that's going to be a massive benefit to them and why that's important and how it's going to get them better results. What do they actually care about? How it's going to be down their body less um, and they're going to start you know, feeling a, a certain way, right? But you got to communicate that multiple times. It can't just be, oh, I made an email and I communicated. It needs to be on a, a consistent basis, those are things that you can be talking about on the the off the mic. I mean, like at the end of the session that Dustin was talking about, uh, hey, tomorrow's strength day. The reason why we do strength days is this, 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 and this. Uh, this is why it's important. You need to educate them, right? So one of the, the biggest things is being able to educate your your clients so they can become advocates of what, what you're doing and why you're doing it and be able to tell other people why you're doing what you're doing. And then you're not just a workout gym anymore, right? Hey, at our gym, we do this, 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 and this. This is why it's beneficial. Like, imagine if you had clients going around telling people that, hey, I love our gym. We do this. This is why we do it. Um, this is why it's good for us. So you need to educate your advocates along the way. Um, and then obviously, if there are some people that I like the old way or I don't like change or I don't want to, like one of the easiest things you can do is say, hey, we're going to try this for 30 days or we're going to try this for 60 days. And then if you guys don't like it, then we'll consider, you know, going back. But this is why we're doing what we're doing, right? So you just want them to have the mindset of I'm trying it. I'm not 1000% committed. But the people that are argumented, like they're arguing with you on what you're doing and what you're like, pull those people aside and have one-off conversations with those clients. Because if you're trying to uh, like argue with everybody, like it doesn't, it doesn't work, right? It's the same thing. If you have a team member that is dysfunctional, don't come down on the team. Like, hey, we need to start doing this, this, and this, and this. When it's really one person, that's the problem. Address yeah. the one person privately, right? 
Uh, because even though you're going to make these changes that you feel are beneficial, you are going to have the five percenters, no matter what you do. Like you can literally say, I am going to donate a million dollars and there'll be 5% of people that say you should have donated $2 million. Like address those people in private. There's no reason to uh, upset the 95% that are on board and, and cool with, with what you're doing. Um, and a good example of this is like uh, way back in the day, we brought the concept of bring it in and break it down at the end of the session. And when you first bring that to your location, like you, people are like, this is weird. This is different. I'm not on board, right? And it's literally just saying, hey, this is why we do it. Um, just commit for the next 30 days, right? And then the people that are being jerks and don't want the, the community aspect, just talk to them privately. Um, and then eventually, you know, ultimately they, they get on board. So I think that's the biggest thing. And then your frequency of training your team when you first implement something needs to be more frequent. Uh, I think gym owners make a big mistake when they go to implement something that they do like a, team training and that's where the training ends right so dustin talked mm -hmm. about hey every 90 days but like you can't be like i implement and then 90 days later i'm checking into it when you first get going it should go from weekly right and then monthly and then quarterly but no more than no less than quarterly um because the other aspect of it too is like yeah, we're incre every time you train, they increase their skills, but their motivation level to implement on what you're teaching is also going to be at the highest, especially if you're expressing, hey, this is the product we want to provide. This is why we want to provide it. This is why we're going to do what we're going to do. And you're really filling your team's cup to go provide the best product humanly possible. But the training has to be on a consistent basis. So anytime you implement something, think weekly, right? So if you have a new coach that's coming on board, they should be getting daily and weekly feedback. And then as they go, you can lessen the feedback until you're on a you know monthly or quarterly basis. But it needs to be more frequent, more consistent in order for it to stick in your team to actually believe that it's important. If you just come in and say, hey, this is important and this is the changes we're going to make and then you do your thing and then you never talk about it again, does your team perceive that that's important and that it's mission critical? Absolutely yep. not, right? So your frequency of communication also let your team know how important it is that we implement these things. Um, and the, the last part of that too is, obviously we're kind of talking to people that they're not necessarily going in and overhauling a gym, but if your product right now is not where it needs to be, you do have to come in with the, you, you know, the, the mindset of overhaul, but try not to overhaul everything at one time, yeah. right? So being able to be able to say, hey, this month, this is gonna be their focus. And then once that's good, then add something else. If you try to add a thousand things at one time, nothing's going to stick and they're not going to do anything, you know, super well. So be very methodic about adding what you're adding um, and kind of think of it as dominoes. What's the first domino that we need to work on? What's the next domino? What's the next domino? Because like for me, I want everything better tomorrow, right? So I'll go in and be like, we need to fix this, 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 this. And all we do is like overwhelm the team and then we make zero traction versus being disciplined enough to go, what's the first thing we need to focus on? And it's the same thing as like setting priorities in your company, right? If you have a hundred priorities, you have none. But if you have a few priorities, those will actually get done inside of your business. It's the same thing when you're trying to overhaul the product is really understand what's the most important thing when you first get going, change that, and then implement the, the next thing. Love it. All right. Well, that is all good advice for you guys for product. We're going to move on to what we change with marketing and how to get trials and new people through the door. Because I identified, like I mentioned earlier on the green flags, they had a good cost per lead. We cranked up the ad spend. Like when you see good numbers, you want to crank it up, especially at key times during the year. And this was definitely after we rehabbed the coaching product, it was a perfect time to crank up that ad spend. And um, they were getting... Uh, too many yeses, like, you know, it was like really easy because it was a really low trial, $67. And so immediately doubled it and didn't get a whole lot more friction. Like we went to a $127 trial for a 28 day trial. Again, lots of yeses. It is a better economic area. So like people are not flinching at that. And that was great because that also increased conversion, just that one extra thing, you know? So 
that is uh, one thing to kind of always call out. And me and Matt, you know, see that is sometimes people get stuck in this very stubborn ad spend. They just do the same daily spend and the same monthly spend. And they don't look at, you know, your seasonality of your business. Like there are times you want to put in more when you obviously do the work to get your good cost per lead and good ROAS and all those types of things. But when you're not going to be, you know, uh, spending is, you know, uh, the times that you want to be know knowing to drop it. And so it's like, it's not the same number all year round. So you want to know when am I going to get a good return on my ad spend, AKA ROAS, and when should I increase it? And when should I, you know, kind of go to more of my maintenance ad spend? So that was, you know, one thing. And then uh, that was huge because we had our first big trial that had over 30 people in it in a month, which they never seen. And it really rocked their world and the amount of people in the sessions. And so now the team's starting to see the vision. They're starting to feel their momentum and, you know, good things are happening. Um, on top of that was adding email blasts. They were doing literally for two years, zero email blasts. And so this was like, you know, just exciting for me because I like email marketing. And so just adding in a cadence of doing two a week and starting to warm up that list, I just saw so much opportunity and it wasn't a giant list, you know, it was like 1500 uh, people, but uh, sales started coming from that without needing, you know, ad spend. And so when you have good sales on your ads and you're getting them from your email, like you're just really doubling down. And then on top of that, of course, text blast, you know, text blast going out once a week to their database. And so we implemented a uh, lead nurture process called the five by two. And so this is what we teach our sales reps at gym reinforcements to do. And you guys should definitely do this if you're not doing it yourself, but a new lead comes in, you want to reach out to them five days straight, twice a day, because they have given you permission when they have opted into something, they've given you permission to sell them. So you want to get a hold of them as quickly and as aggressively as possible. And so it's a simple, you know, text in the morning or afternoon, call them at night and you repeat that for five days. Most people will reach out once and they'll reach out one more time a week later and then they'll call it quits and they'll say that person was not motivated. No, the world is a noisy place. You suck at lead nurture. You need to reach out to them more. That's the answer. It's not that they're not motivated. It's they're busy and they're distracted and you need to break through the noise. And so that was just a simple thing we did. And we saw again, the high amount of sales because that same ad spend got us a lot of leads and then a lot of sales. And then we got database sales from email and text blast. And so it's just raining trials constantly. And to this day, it's still doing that. And so that is essentially just some basic marketing and lead nurture stuff not being done that we were able to add. And then to double down on that, like a lot of people will sell a trial or a challenge and then they'll turn off marketing. They'll turn off getting new people in and they'll wait till the trial or trial challenge ends and then they'll start it up again. And that's a huge mistake. One of the things that me and Matt love to show people is you want to ask your trials or challengers for referrals while they're still active in that trial or challenge. And one of the things that I deployed in this uh, location was a friends and family week. So every time we're doing a big challenge, like in the middle of it, week three, week four, you do a friends and family week and all the challengers can bring friends and family. And then you have some sort of shorter term program they can enroll in if they loved it. If that week was awesome and they were like, this was cool. Thanks for inviting me. Cool. Well, you should join this 21 day program they have starting this next Monday. And so that is something that doesn't cost anything. Your coaches just need to announce it and you just need to email and text your members and you can just make it rain referrals. And so that was something that we put in place for marketing. And that happens at least on a quarterly basis. The next was, uh, I mentioned QR codes earlier. You guys can find these on Amazon, just a simple, give us a review on Google sign. And then it has a QR code that you just link directly to your Google. People are just giving your Google business page five-star reviews and all they got to do is go and scan it. And so you can just plan throughout the year specific times you ask for it. And you can even tie an incentive. You could say, hey guys, please give us a review on Google. We appreciate it. It helps us get the word out. And we're actually going to pick one person who reviews us this week to win a free t-shirt or whatever you want to give away. But, you know, put incentives in place and that from a marketing standpoint, helps your Google ranking. When you're when Google sees two things, it ranks you higher, that you are actively getting five-star reviews. Uh, I've seen some gyms that they did not get a five-star review in two years, and it's just because they simply don't ask or they don't have a place in an automation where an ask goes out 
And so no one's really going to go and do this on their own. They need to be prompted. And so we definitely systemize prompting for five-star reviews. And so that helps your Google ranking. The other thing is activity on posting on your Google account. And so even just once a week, post a video, uh, sorry, a, a photo of your client's post session or any kind of, you know, marketing photos that you got post it on there because Google sees you're active on your, you know, they call it GMB, Google My Business. They want to see you posting and they want to see you getting reviews. And that naturally organically will raise your Google ranking without you having to do a whole lot of like keyword optimizing or SEO stuff. If, you know, you want to be the number one ranked facility when people search gym near me, trainer near me, bootcamp near me, you want to put some energy into growing your Google ranking. And so that is that. The final thing to help us to market and, and, you know, add more trials, that's just easy, low hanging fruit. You need someone trained to do it every single time is when you do sell a trial or a challenge, ask them for a referral, ask if they have a buddy that wants to do this with them. Do you, Hey, by the way, you know, we got you signed up. We, do you have a spouse or a friend or a family member or a friend that will want to do this with you? And if you just make it really casual and cool, some people give it to you, some won't. At Gym Reinforcements, we see 30% take rate. About three out of 10 people will will bring you a buddy and just literally hand you their information and say, yeah, this person, let's, let, I'd like to get them to join this with me, right? That was just something we implemented to, again, add more trials. And so these are the things that work, guys. These are the basics. They were just simply not doing the basics. So I came in and you know deployed what I call like the black belt basics. Like they need to do these white belt things to earn their black belt. And it all started working, right? Most gyms that I talk to are fine are just not doing these things on a consistent basis. They might hear this and then they get excited and do it for a week and then it doesn't happen anymore. So protect yourself from yourself. I'm a big fan of Google Calendar. Set reminders. If you're like, oh, Matt and Dustin said I should do this quarterly, I'm gonna put this on my calendar. I'm gonna put it on quarterly reoccurring and now I won't forget. Or I, they said I should do this weekly. I'm gonna put this on a Wednesday to re reoccur Wednesday. And now it's built in. You and your team will be reminded by your calendars to do the things you got to do. Matt, anything marketing wise that you would share that you see gym owners fail at that would really help them to grow? The the biggest thing you kind of talked about it is is the ad spend and the ability and willingness to spend money. Because biggest thing I get when I get on audits is like, hey, how much do you spend on marketing? I'm like, well, my budget's twenty dollars a day, or my budget's fifty dollars a day, or my, and it's like hey, if it's, that's the limiting factor, right? So like, what does your budget allow you to get in leads or what does your budget allow you to get in, you know, trial, like trials coming in and that's the cap on your growth. So if you know your numbers and you're really your 30 day cash cycle of um, like, for example, if you're generating leads, how many leads does it take to get a trial? And then what is that trial worth? If you can have a one-to-one -one ratio of, you know, your ad spend to whatever you're getting in trials in that 30 day period, you essentially have an unlimited ability to spend money on marketing. But if you don't know that and you don't understand that, then a lot of people, their cap is just, they're like, I want to get 50 trials this month. But then they're like, I'm going to spend $20 a day. But if getting 50 trials this month, like needs to be $50 a day, unless you're willing to spend $50 a day, then you're never going to be able to do that. So you have to reverse engineer of what does it cost me to get whatever outcome I want? And then that should dictate your spending budget, not the other way around, because you can't go, I'm only going to spend this and then hope for something different. That's not how it works. You have to reverse engineer uh, the outcome. And one of the things like reverse engineering a budget would be, okay, traditionally, let's say you're running a challenge how much does it traditionally cost you to get somebody to to do the challenge? And let's say it's $50 uh, traditionally for cost of acquisition. So your cost of acquisition is $50 and you want 100 challengers. Well, then you better be willing to spend $5,000 on your marketing or you're not going to make that happen, right? So th those are just things to, to be thinking about as you go. And then the other big thing I see uh, when I do audits is people don't do anything to build their email list and they're not actively doing anything with that email list. Just like you you talked about that gym had 1,500 people that they could communicate to and they were not communicating to them whatsoever. Um, so with that proper email marketing, 
um, is going to be really important as well. And those big changes make a massive difference uh, inside of someone's business. So those are some of the biggest things I see when I do my audits and I work with gyms is the willingness to spend money, but reverse engineering the outcome that they desire. And, and then, you know, ultimately leveraging one of the biggest tools that they have, which, which is their email list. Yes. And the big underlying theme here is just like knowing your numbers. Like, how do I know my coaching product's bad? I'm looking at my attrition and my conversion. How do I know my marketing's good? It's like, what's my CPL and my return on my ad spend and, you know, my cash on cash return. And so it's just like, hopefully everyone's grasping from this. If you don't know your numbers, make this the year that you really choose to get, you know, involved in looking at them. And just same thing I was bringing up earlier, put a reoccurring reminder on your calendar to look at your numbers and force yourself to do it. And the first time you do it, you probably won't know what the heck's going on, but you need patterns, you need repetition, and you eventually train your eyes to see what me and Matt see. So, and if, if you're, um, listening to this episode and we're talking about numbers and it's kind of driving you crazy. We did a very early episode on the, the big three metrics inside of your business. So I would recommend going back to that episode because we we really break it down. Um, obviously, if you just want a, a deep dive in your business, just go to gymaudit.com and I can do it for you. Hey, gym owners, are you looking to take your business to the next level? Well, I wanted to let you know we have open enrollment now for the Fitness Empire Mastermind, where we give you everything you need to grow your business. We have done for you marketing campaigns. We even have team trainings where we train your team members for you. And we have a ton of done for you assets and resources. And it's all inside the Fitness Empire Mastermind. We have weekly coaching calls as well. So you can talk to me or Matt directly. And it's a lot different than this podcast where it's just a one-way conversation. We're just talking at you. Well, in the mastermind, we can actually exchange dialogue and we can help you grow your business. And the best part is you get a one-on-one -on -one call with him or myself every single month so we can help you to outline your attack plan to grow your business. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, go to fitnessempiremastermind.com to apply. Not all gym owners are gonna be a good fit. I just wanna call that out now because we need you to be at a certain level to be able to take action on what we teach. And also we gotta make sure you're good for the culture within our mastermind. We're very protective that only positive and coachable owners join the program. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, go to fitnessempiremastermind.com to apply. Yeah, beautiful. All right, well, we're gonna move on to leadership. And by the way, these are not in order. Like obviously I was working on, you know, like different things at the same time but like i just packaged them into different areas and so i definitely knew the other big thing that this gym needed and it took a while to find i thought i was going to come in and again it's me so i'll find a leader in the next 30 days and it took six months this was definitely the part that i had to be the most patient on and rank like matt i want things fixed tomorrow because i literally know what needs to be done but the world doesn't move at your pace the world moves at its own pace and so you can't rush finding that rock star person. So we ended up hiring one that was not a good fit pretty quickly, I'd say within three or four months, but then 60 days later we made a switch and that's when the game changed. And so let me share with you guys kind of side-by-side -side example of these two general managers. So the first one we brought in definitely impressed me with their business acumen. And in fact, they even brought me a one-year growth plan of how they grow the business. They, they, they basically got to see the total members, the EFT, everything. And they said, we're going to do this and this and this. And that really kind of got my attention versus the other applicants. And then we got them on board. We said, okay, this is awesome. You, you know, you have a plan. I got a plan. Let's work together. Let's do it. And so they started out hot. And I'd say about 60 days in, things just started going wrong. Like they just started making excuses. They started skipping out early because again, when someone's in a manager role, they could take advantage. And so it's like, they can tell you I wouldn't do that, but then will they? We don't know till they get in, right? And so that's why I love that phrase from Seth Godin. He says, I can't work with you till I work with you. And that's the ultimate acid test. We start actually working together. So that was, you know, basically abuse of power. Second is scatterbrain. They had good business acumen because they study it, but they were then getting distracted by all the opportunities out there. Oh man, I should go, you know do sales for insurance and I should go start up a, you know, an Amazon drop shipping business. And so they brought that one year plan, but I realized they're really good at just looking at businesses and planning out what to do with them, but not sticking with one and 
long haul doing it over and over and over again. Um, this was somebody who very much craved variety. So they needed to change businesses all the time and, and not stick to one um, for a long extended period of time. Um, and then the final thing is they were losing the respect of the team because they wouldn't get their hands dirty. There was a lot of telling them what to do, but they wouldn't do it themselves. And so all these were just red flags in a very quick amount of time. And so quickly realized this isn't going to work and we got to pull the plug. Um, and I guess the final one I would say is in terms of sales, like they did good if the person was booked for them and they were pretty much warmed up but they always dug their heels in the ground and said, I'm not going to call somebody cold and bother them, quote unquote, which is like literally what the role of a general manager, like you are here to do sales. And so you will be doing cold. And so I must have not made that abundantly clear. And so that's on me. So that was failed. General manager didn't go well, brought in the next one game changer. I definitely uh, believe that this is a huge part of the business growing. Obviously, I brought in experience, I brought in systems, but when the right people run those systems, it's just lights out. And so um, this person essentially was having a little bit of a chip on their shoulder from the past because they applied for a manager role and they were skipped over. And so they always had this dream of becoming a manager. And you could see there was like some of that status they desired, like that role, that title really, you know, something which can be dangerous, but like on this person, I can sense they're humble and it wasn't um, just an ego trip that they just wanted a title to feel important. Like they just really wanted to move up in their skill set and demonstrate what they got. They had motivations to make money, which is good when you pair that person in a sales role because they have the ability to earn commissions. Um, they were a go-getter, action taker, and the best part is they were very coachable. I would literally say something notes are taken and it was done later that day or by the next day within 24 hours. And so when I have somebody that coachable and those are like the favorite gym owners for me and Matt to work with, those are the gym owners that get the best from mentorship and they see their business completely change. Like they, sometimes it's good to just not even know why we told you to do it, but just do it. And it's not because we are, we're these crazy control freaks. We just got experience and we're just speaking from, you know, the mistakes we've made and we just want to shortcut it. And so you know, eventually you need to understand the why so you can think that way too. But it's almost like turn off that why question and just go is going to be the best way to grow your business quickly. Just take action. And they also had great communication, um, kind of fell off over time with the first GM, but the next one was just giving me updates throughout the day. And I'm not just saying like every little small thing that happened in the gym, like meaningful updates. And so that is good for me. If you guys are like me, communications like oxygen. If I'm not talking to my team, I literally feel like I'm suffocating and I'm choking. When we have communication, I can rest easy and I know things are happening that need to be happening. So um, that was definitely a, a big plus. And then finally, conviction. Like they were all in on fitness. They work out regularly. They transform themselves physically. And so when you have somebody in the, in the gym that's the leader, and they can connect with the clients because they've transformed with them and they can connect with the coaches. That is the the double whammy that you're looking for when it comes to a manager. And so it doesn't mean they have to be overweight. It, they could just be somebody that just values fitness, but that that conviction has to be there at the highest level because from that from you, it gets watered down to them and then it gets watered down to the team. And so if they do, if they don't have that conviction and it needs to go from you to the frontline staff, like it's definitely going to be majorly watered down. So they had very high conviction. And then the final thing I'd say is they really had a good blend of knowing how to do good with the hard skills and the soft skills. Like they can be a punch in the face, accountability person to the team and the clients, but they also could like write a very nice handwritten card or give you a shout out and be that encourager and be that soft skills person too. And so um, though those were all the wins in terms of, you know, leadership, but you know, going back to some of the things that, you know, you brought up, Matt, like, first of all, leadership is everything. Like, it, it doesn't matter any of these systems. If we put them into a gym where the owner was not all in on their business as an operator, or they didn't have a manager that's all in as an operator, they're all worthless. Like you need to have the right people in there and culture is a huge part of it. And so a lot of what the previous team wasn't getting was they weren't really getting any recognition. They were just basically getting compensation. And so let's get it straight. Compensation is not recognition. Compensation is compensation. And so they were now getting more verbal praise. And so they were rising to the occasion. They're asking to do more. 
and they were more receptive to changes where before there was a lot of fighting because no matter how well I, you know, voiced it, I was not there and they're not going to be bought into me as much. They needed on-site leadership, daily leadership, and a person that they can connect with and build a relationship with. And now when that person expresses changes, they'll be more receptive to it. Otherwise, it's this mystery guy telling us what to do. Screw him, screw the man. And it doesn't matter how nice or how well I package it, there's always going to be that like, you know, underlying feeling. So those were some things that, you know, I would just share with you guys as a comparison. We had the good and ugly. We had a great one. And immediately I even go back and look at the books. EFT within 60 days shot up 6K just from this person taking over sales and retention even got improved. And so it's like that wasn't a marketing play or, or a sexy ad or new equipment. It was just a person. So remember that because sometimes I've even felt prey to it. It's like, man, my gym was just located here or we was just like opened up. We had more space or like if I had that new sexy equipment, everything would be better. And it's no, nope. usually the biggest thing that changes the business is the people running the business. It's, it's a reflection of the team. So Matt, anything you would add on that in terms of leadership? Yeah. On, in the leadership role, like I, very blunt. They got to have the give a shit factor, right? Like if without the give a shit factor, you can have all the quote unquote skills, the book skills, you can have the, I know what I'm supposed to do, but everyone knows if they, if they have a leader that gives a shit, clients know if you care, team knows if you care. And that's the, the biggest factor. And then two, you know, their relationship with you is important because part of their job is to defend you as the leader. And I learned this from Ed Milet probably five years ago. And he said, your frontline leaders their part of their job is to defend you as a leader because like you're actively going to war to grow the business and there's going to be some things that people don't like or makes them feel uncomfortable or they don't like how you talk to them or they don't like how you did x y and z because you don't have the the relationship capital with them their job is to to defend you and, and make sure that the, your team member states and your client states about you as the business owner like are in good states because if team members and clients have bad states, which is their thoughts, their beliefs, and their feelings about you, that's not good for business, right? So, but you have to sometimes do things that are unpopular, that people don't like. So they have to, you know, be able to go to bat to you. Like if a team member is complaining about you, they would be like, hey, like totally understand how you feel, but this is why Dustin had to do that. Or this is why Matt had had to do that, um, you know, and like defend you. Right. Oftentimes, and we've had, you know, uh, podcasts about bad managers is they'll throw you or the company under the bus to make them look like the the good guy. But that actually hurts to be able to to run the, the business. So good managers do that. Your first person that we talked about, I used to have uh, a team member and she would always say uh, that person person's Johnny talk a lot of shit where. They come in, they promise the world and they're going to do X, Y, and Z and they're going to hustle and they're going to grow the business and they're going to, but when push comes to shove, are they willing to actually do what they're talking about? And uh, a lot of times people that come in that seem very polished and very, you know, like at the end of the day, right? Like if that person's so good at business and they have this plan, you know, why, why are they taking a management job at a gym when they're say in their 30s and 40s that they've really got their crap together right so they sound polished they seem like oh man this person's going to be so awesome but their life's not together right based on uh and and i don't care if anyone hates this or not our worst trainers ever are like mid 30 to 40 year old males that have gone from five to six different gyms they have all the skills and all the experience but man their life is a not not in a good place or else they want to be applying for a you know mid-level coaching job in the fitness industry when they're 35 40 years old right so um but on paper they interview well they say all the right things and you're like oh my god this is, person's going to be so awesome but there's a reason why they're in the position that they're currently in it's not because they've been doing the right things in their life no, I mean. right so smooth talkers you definitely have to to, to worry about them um you know, and, and with that, make sure you guys are getting referrals, like going back to uh, their past job interviews and even in the job interviews, like threatening that you're going to go and talk to their their employers because then you get some of the dirts and some of the red flags. But, you know, if you're an optimist like me and Dustin are optimists, we'll look at 
the positives of that person yes. and will overlook the the red flags uh, in in that scenario. And it's like you can put yourself behind six to nine months by hire, hiring the wrong leader because they're going to go in and destroy things, hurt your culture, and then you have to rebuild after you've been trying to rebuild, right? So getting that first hire and it's really the give a shit factor. Does that person have the give a shit factor necessary to, to grow the locations? And a lot of it starts with the passion side of it. Obviously the second person, very passionate, had, had their, their life changed, right? With fitness, they know the impact of that. And then they're good with people and care about people. Like them, you can give them the skills. Bang. And you, if you're active in the business and you're, you're dictating the marketing, you're dictating the direction of the, where the business is going, you don't need that person to have a bunch of business acumen. What you can't do is you can't replace that give a crap factor. You can help them with the skills to be able to run and operate the business. I hope everybody really rewinds and goes back and, and does that because I know I made that mistake many times over. Didn't call references. They came across as a good person. What could go wrong? Let's do, let's jump into working together, and that's where things go wrong. So, um, on that, there was a, a like a, a a matrix that I shared with our mastermind called the Culture Skills Matrix. So I'm just compelled to share this with you guys. And I know again, if you're listening, I'll do my best to explain it. But it's the typical four quadrant matrix. The bottom left is they have negative marks on the culture and the skills. Obviously, this is an instant fire. This is someone you would never even try to bring on board. They are not good with skills and they don't have the good culture fit. And then the upper right-hand corner is they have a plus with both. They're high culture and they're high skilled. And this is like a, a player, keep them around. They're awesome, never let them go. Now, where the debate comes up is the upper left and the bottom right. So the bottom right is that they do not have culture but they have skills so they are negative and they are toxic and they're talking crap and they're gossiping and they don't fit, fit your core values but like they're really smart with training and they're really good with um sales or whatever the role is and so that is very easy to suss out and for people to say okay they're not a culture fit it sucks they're skilled but they gotta go the upper left is they are positive on culture but negative on skills so they're really great culture fit they're very positive everybody likes them they're very likable they're happy they're nice but they they struggle with the skills and in, in my opinion this one could be the most dangerous and this can be the hardest to police because like people have a hard time coming down on someone nice like what if they're not that negative toxic you know uh just a brash person like it's easy to say man you're being a jerk you gotta go but what if the person is really nice and they're not, uh, you know, getting to their to their goal and they're not, you know, hitting your KPIs and they're not doing what they need done and they're not producing? That's what I feel like most gym owners are like, man, but they're a really nice guy. I'll give them another six months. And then four ver rounds of six months go by and they have it improved. And so that is the culture skills matrix. And so I would definitely encourage you to like, you know, put your team on one of those four quadrants. Hopefully nobody is double negative on both culture and skills. Hopefully you got some great people that are positive on both. But then what about the people who are plus or minus on the other? And what do you need to do with them, right? The culture people, we need to do more training. We need to do more weekly and monthly accountability. The non-culture people, it's very difficult to train that into people. I would just argue it's probably best you kind of make a switch there because like that's just not something you can really instill into somebody. Usually the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And if they've been acting like that in the past, it's not going to probably change anytime soon. All right. So moving on to the next thing is onboardings. So what do we fix with onboardings? Well, at first they were doing one-on-one -on -one orientations and that's not bad if you have the volume that you can keep up with. But eventually when you got a lot of spinning plates, you need to start to prioritize and you, but you don't want to have the quality suffer. So we moved to group orientations and that's a huge time saver because I can have 20 people all come to the gym on a Saturday and I can wave them in and take their photo and help them get their app set up and explain how the program works. That's just a huge time savings for me. Uh, Monday night's another popular time, but just like pick a time where you can just make uh, the most out of your time, but also not let quality suffer. So we implemented that. And then, you know, essentially had a, a welcome email as well to back up everything that we set at orientation. So the client had everything virtually and the, everything I said didn't just kind of fall on deaf ears. And so that way it's doubled up. 
And then essentially the biggest thing with onboarding is heavy, heavy, heavy accountability to get to their first session. Your non-starters, which are people who buy a trial and never show up, are the least likely to convert and they're also the least likely to just back out of the trial or challenge and either just forfeit the money or even ask for a refund. So you want to hold everybody heavily accountable and get the time they say they're going to come to and then hold them majorly accountable to that first session. That That's the success threshold I found. Like If someone doesn't cross that threshold, you, you just lost the sale. You lost either a potential EFT member or you even maybe have lost the trial revenue. And so we have to hold them accountable. That is a very make or break event. And then the other thing is getting them introduced. So in the onboarding, like onboarding just doesn't stop at orientation. To us, it's like that whole first week. There's, there's more stuff that we need to do. And also in that first session, we add a couple of community factors. So number one, introduce them at the first session. Everybody feels like the new kid on the block. They feel uncomfortable. It looks like everybody here knows how the sessions work, except me. So I get introduced now at my first session. That's huge. That introduces them to the community. And then the next thing is we need them to shake hands or face-to-face -face greet and meet at least three other clients in the session so that they feel like they're now making friends and they got some friendly faces and like, oh, I know that guy that like my coach introduced him to him or that's the gal that's like me. She's got, you know, two dogs. And they're the same breed as my dogs. How funny. And so find connection points, but like, hey, new client meet so-and-so. They've been here for two years. They lost 20 pounds. They're a good person to ask questions. Like get them to start to have community bonds community will not happen on its own organically it is an intended thing that you have to put energy into and so that was the next thing that we fixed in terms of onboarding that that was a, a little bit of a shorter list matt anything else you'd add to help people with onboarding um i mean that really hits the, the needle right we want to make them feel like they're a part of our community as quick as fast as humanly possible and overcome a lot of their their concerns and the things that prevent them from moving forward with, with becoming a member. Uh, so that the faster you can get them to feel involved uh, and feel welcome and a part of the community, the more likely they obviously are going to stay. And then really we need to make sure that they are coming three, three days a week. Um, so like Dustin's point, like get them scheduled, like how far out can you get them scheduled for workouts? At least a full week, right? Like statistically speaking, if they don't come three days a week or more, they're 50% more likely to cancel. Um, and if they're not coming, and, and for me, the, the big thing that I really stress is the first couple of weeks. Um, if your trial's 21 days or 28 days, we start worrying about them in like weeks three and four because that's when they're going to convert. But they're making their decision in those, those first week, week and a half of their uh, membership, whether or not they're going to continue on and stay with us um, based on that experience. So the urgency of the, the front end of a, like needs to be on the front end of a trial, not on the back end. And I think that's where everyone screws it up. It's like, hey, they really haven't been coming in weeks one and two. Let's really try to get them in for weeks three and four because that's when they're gone. Wow. Like, think about it. When are you the most motivated? When you start a program, right? So take advantage of that, get them involved, make sure they're coming. Um, and if they're coming, then they can see value. If they're not coming, they won't see value and they won't become a member no matter what your offer is. So that is the the number one thing. Make them feel like they're involved and then ultimately make sure that they're coming and they're attending. And then if you are doing reach outs, make sure that they are engaging because if yeah. they're not engaging with your reach outs, I, like, I like to tell my team and, and people I work with, just picture them giving you the middle finger because they're not responding to you and they're ghosting you. If they're mm -hmm. ghosting you for just a reach out, like that's not good. If they're having a really good experience and they appreciate what you guys are providing, they won't ghost you. So those are the the big things that, you know, ultimately we we look at. And then it's what are you covering at orientation? Like how are you showing them value uh, throughout the process? Um, is it just, hey, this is how you work out and these are our rules? Or are we going, hey, look at showing them client stories, showing them videos of clients that were in their shoes and completely transformed their life and showing them this is how we, this is our proven process to to get you results. And then kind of going over the rules and what to expect and overcoming the nerves. And then the team is ready for them Monday one. The team knows when they're coming in, they know their name, 
Um, and the team knows that they need to be the welcoming parade and making sure that uh, those clients are getting love. And then, you know, the other thing that we harp on with our coaches is, hey, make sure that they're getting a lot of love, right? Like you're coming to them, checking in with them, making sure that everything's okay with them through throughout the workout. And then it's not even just shake hands with three people. Make sure it's the right three people, right? Like yes, there, there's some people that are, you would not want them to introduce them to to your worst enemy because they just have a bad attitude or they don't want to be bothered because they're to work out. Like we've had clients that, man, they like, they're amazing in the sense of like they work out hard, they're great. But a uh, couple of times they got paired up with people and they like pretty much like gave them resting bitch face and act annoyed that they had to deal with that person in, in the workout because, you know, they're a little bit more hardcore and they're there to work out. They're not there to be your friend and they're not there to be your buddy and they're not. But there are some people that, you know, they're the welcoming committee and they treat everyone real good. And, you know, those are the people that you want engaging with them when they first get started because it can feel like high school. Um, when uh, when we were doing a lot of large group, like we had sessions, man, they were packed, 60, 70 people. And people had their station, their, their starting spot. And God forbid a new person came into their station. So those people felt like it was like high school or middle school all over again, clicks and they didn't fit in and they didn't belong. And that's their first experience with us. You guys have to program the first experience and how do we want to make people feel? I'm not kidding when I say 80% of our business is high energy coaching sessions designed to make people feel good. So if you're just checking the box and going, hey, make three introductions, but those three introductions don't make people feel good, we're missing the mark, yes. right? So your coaches have to understand it's not just three introductions. It's, hey, who's the three introductions is that at 5 a.m., these are my three people. At 5.45 or 5.30, these are my people. At 6 a.m., these are my people that I know I'm going to go introduce them and I'm going to pair that person with that person during the workout because we would also do that as well as we pair them up with the, the right people because they're new they're lost. They don't really understand how to rotate. They don't know what the hell's going on. And that person's kind of like dragging them along. But then the other thing is you have to go back to training your clients. Uh, okay. Let's just say you just, you, you got this big challenge. You got say 60, 70, 80 new people starting. Your Some of your clients are going to be like, oh, there's more people at the gym and someone's going to, you know, they might be annoyed. Uh, so then they don't treat people very well. And it's, it's really sad, but sometimes you have to remind people how to treat human beings. Yes. Right. So like, Hey, exciting news. We got 60 new challengers starting this week. Obviously with that session is going to be a little bit more busy. Just remember your first day. Let's be the welcoming crew. Let's make them feel welcome. Like we got the best community on planet earth. Like make sure you're encouraging them and uh, telling them they can do it. Like, just remember your first day. Let's treat them how you would like to be treated on on your first day. Well, um, and I, I had to learn that lesson one time. Uh, we had, I want to say one location was like 118, 120 new people starting in a challenge, and I didn't make the message. And people were bitching and complaining and just being dicks to people, right? And I was like, oh, that's my fault. Right. That's my fault because I didn't message that. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when you got 20 new people in a session and things are crowded and things are different, like it's easy to be upset at those 20, 20 new people in a session versus being excited that we got 20 new people in the session and that I need to check myself for a second. So yeah. as a business owner, sometimes we have to go, OK, here's the situation. Now we need to influence people's states, their thoughts, their beliefs, and their feelings about what's about to happen. And we need to proactively communicate when those things are about to happen, right? Or else it's going to have the opposite of what we want to happen. So I always say the best leaders are always thinking about how do I influence people's states or what are people's states going to be about X? And then how do I go about influencing those things? Um, and then the people that are great to people that are coming in, make sure they're getting thank you cards. Make sure they're getting gift cards. Make sure that like they're getting the recognition and the appreciation. Just say, hey, just so you know, I always pair people up with you because you're always so nice and kind. And 
you're the type of culture that I want inside of our locations. And I would love to duplicate you. If if you ever get upset that we're pairing you up with people, like let me know. But the reason why I do that is because you're so freaking awesome and we love you. And like, I just really appreciate you and, and, and thank you for doing that, right? That goes such a long way because if you're just abusing those people and pairing them up and they don't really understand why you're pairing them up and they don't feel appreciated, they feel, they're going to feel like they're being taken advantage of. Yes. And then, you know, so with like, Again, leadership is influence, but what are we influencing? We're influencing people's states, their thoughts, their beliefs, and feelings around whatever it is. And when we talk about communication, the greatest communicators are always, always, always thinking about how do I influence people's states to be positive about whatever I am trying to to implement and do inside of my business. Love it. All right. Very good tip on that and so guys again hopefully you're, you're loving this episode as much as we're loving it final area that i rehab that i want to go with you guys and uh, i saved my personal favorite for last and that's sales the sales process how do we rehab it well first things first we had to change the price they were underpriced for their market they were 127 a month we immediately raised them to 167 a month and so it wasn't that big of a change because it was a $10 increase on weekly billing. They were doing 32 a week, we went to 42 a week. Not a hard thing to do. And so that immediately, we didn't, and just to be clear, we didn't raise the rate on the members. We didn't, we don't want to piss them off. We, we locked them in, but this is for new business going forward, new memberships. And then the final thing is on that membership increase, we did switch to weekly billing and got everybody on the weekly train because there are many, uh, I think up to four or five week months. And so you just eat an extra week of payroll without extra revenue to compensate for it. And so that really helps to even things out. And so that was the next change that we made as well. So in terms of the front end offer, the trial, the challenge, we raised the price on those I mentioned earlier, but we also said that we're going to add a 12 month contract because they were on a month to month contract without any notice. It was literally like request to cancel same day processing. And it was like, oh, no, 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 this ain't going to work. Um, you don't give people an easy out like that, especially in fitness. We have to make them more committed. So we implemented a 12 month contract with a 30 day notice. And then immediately the LTV, you know, because I look at lifetime value of two things. Number one, how long are they staying? And then also, how much were, were they worth in terms of how much revenue the company, you know, was able to collect from them. So like the, the lifetime actually went, went higher and people were staying longer. So just simple thing, adding contracts, which again, I know gym owners don't like, I don't want to lock people in. I don't want to make them, but you're doing them a favor because by allowing them to have an easy back door, you're allowing quitters to do what they do best. And that's quit. And so if you're a great coach, you have to push and, and against that and create friction. And so that was that. But even on the front end, if you want to help people, if on day one, you're like, hey, anytime you want to quit, just quit. Like yeah, you don't, you don't program worry. them to quit. The, the other thing is when money gets tight, you know, we're always going to be a commodity. We can say like, hey, have such a great product that you're the last thing to be cut and you're the, but if you're $150, $200 a month and they know they can just cut you in a second, when people get into survival mode, not like it doesn't matter. Nothing matters when you get into survival mode, right? Like, hey, I can cut, cut my gym or I'm going to struggle to pay my rent. You're gone, right? If they think they can just cut you, you are gone. So uh, during COVID, like COVID period, getting people to commit to a gym was really, really challenging. So we made it super simple, like, hey, just... It's a 12 month agreement, but it's 30 day notice. And all you got to do is fill out this form online. Our attrition went through the freaking roof because there's a lot of people in the space like, hey, it doesn't matter. Like your attrition is not going to be affected. So there's a lot of people saying that. I was like, okay, makes sense because it made it easy to sell a membership, right? Hey, it's, it's a 12 month, but it's 30 day to cancel. Like just fill out a form, no big deal. Um, but the attrition went through like we never had a nutrition problem and then like six month period just like went through the roof and it was like no shit on day one you're telling them cancel anytime you want and then it's really simple and easy to do uh, right um so you know with that i know you're gonna talk about increasing the, the friction here in a second but i i'm so adamant when i get on audits and people are like hey this is my problem i'm like you gotta go 
like go back to the uh, go back to saying it's a 12 month because like I, you're not going to help anybody in a month to month you're not going to help anybody in two months or three months right like it's it's going to take 12 months for us to truly help you lose the weight and learn how to keep it off right yeah. so you're not helping anybody by just establishing you just quit anytime you want um does it make sales a little bit more challenging potentially but obviously i would rather work a little bit harder on the front end to, to get the sale to know that i'm closing the back door and and you know to add the friction it is 30 day notice but we did put a requirement that they got to fill out a feedback form interview style with the gm it's not a form we send them because we tried that and we just got one word answers because they just want to power through it and get it done with so they can process their cancel so essentially we don't want to like plan it as an event. We just want it to happen organically when the GM calls from a point of concern when they do submit for cancel. So it's like, hey, I saw you want to cancel. Can we hop on the phone? And then hop on the phone and then just go over the questions, you know, however many you got and knock it out. But essentially um, that is something that helped as well because we're able to save a good amount of deals because we got the real reason, not the surface answer. Surface is always, you know, time, money, schedule change, whatever. But then it was like, hey, can I ask you a question? Have you seen results in the last 30 days? You're like, well, now you asked, not really. Like, is that a reason? Is, is, could we, you know, maybe commit to going hard for the next eight weeks and, you know, resave you staying here? And so, the person then is like more open to it because now we're getting to something that is in our control. Like we can't control their schedule changes. We can't control if their money changes, but we can control the results. And so if we kind of do a little onion peeling and we discover that the real reason that's deep rooted that they're quitting is because they just are not seeing results. They lost belief in the program. We discovered that through this exit interview and then we're able to resave them. And so we put them on something we call the respark program. So essentially, what this is, is re-sparking their love for the program, re-sparking their commitment to their goals and re-sparking our team to get motivated to help them. Cause you know, we're humans, people get lost in the shuffle. Maybe we, because we put so much energy into challengers or these new members and giving them a great onboarding. Maybe we forgot about this person's been here three years and they can feel it and now they're out. And now we have to turn our attention, right? It's kind of like kids, like they need attention and so if you give attention to somebody you're sometimes turning it away from somebody else so essentially we're able to save them by getting them to admit that and you know we say things like a term i learned from matt i love is like give me brutally honest feedback because i want them to say the truth is what i'm trying to get them to say through certain terms and not give me the bs answer and i always say to the team the way we got to voice it is we got to carry the weight don't ever put the weight on the client why they failed or why they're quitting the weight's always on our back. We can handle it. We're strong. So it's like, hey, where, where could I have done better? I think I let you down. I want to commit to you for another eight weeks. And it's those statements where you're taking the blame. You're not putting it on them. And, you know, that's uh, sadly why I hear a lot of gym room. They're quitters. They're, you know, whatever. They're tire kickers. But it's like, hey, like you, you have to be mindful that the reason somebody comes to our gym is that they are unable to do it on their own. They lack the motivation. They have a history of quitting. They have a emotional attachment to food. These are the people we serve. So like, don't turn it against them. Understand that's what the business you got into. And so, um, so that's something that we we've developed and essentially, you know, that is a huge friction ad that saves sales many, many times. A lot of people just process them as they come in. And that is not the way you want to, because you think it's in service, you know, that's good customer service, but in this business, it's not good customer service to help somebody cancel as quickly as possible. And I, I think that's where it got into is like, hey, if you make it hard on the back end to cancel, you're going to get bad word of mouth and you're going to get X, Y, and Z. Uh, but what I have found is if people quit and they cancel, they're going to make you the bad guy no matter what, because they're not going to be like, you know what? I never went to the gym. They followed up with me all the time and I'm just a lazy person and I wasn't going and, you know, they were like, oh, they didn't do this or they didn't do that or, you know, so you're going to be the bad guy, honestly, no matter what. Um, but really looking in terms of service, are we doing them any favors by letting them just quit? Right. And the answer, their answer is no, because they're not going to go somewhere else and, and take care of their health. They're probably going to be worse off and in, in worse health. Um, but what Dustin's doing that I want to advocate for is he's trying to save them with value. He's not saying, 
hey, come and keep doing something you're not doing anymore, right? He's saying, hey, let's do our Respark program, you know, recommit eight weeks. Here's an outcome that we're going to work towards. So he's really going back to the value equation. And if you hear me speak, I, I bring everything back to the value equation because oftentimes we struggle with people because we're not looking at it from what's actually valuable to that person, right? So desired outcome, which most people want to lose weight because if they think they lose weight, it's going to improve their their life in certain ways. What's the likelihood of achievement of them getting that? So if you just give them the same shit that they were getting for three years and they're not getting results, like what's the likelihood of achievement? Well, I've been doing that for three years and it's not working. So it needs to be different of what they're going to be doing, right? Like we're going to fully commit to you. We're going to do this. We're going to do these check-ins. We're going to do this nutrition. We're going to do this stuff and we're going to re-spark your, your fitness program and get you back on track. But there's still a desired outcome, right? Like that person, if they're 50 pounds overweight, they may say they don't care anymore or they may like hide it and they've suppressed it, but they still have 50 pounds to lose and it's affecting their life, right? So let's let's go all in the next two months and ultimately if we don't get you there, then cancel. Um, but I want to do everything in my power to to help you achieve your goals, right? And then when we look at the bottom of the value equation, we want to reduce that and get that as low as possible is what's the time delay? So two months isn't that long, but two months is long enough that we can do a lot of damage, right? Um, and maybe that person's like, I, I need a lot of accountability. I need a lot of, great, let's get on the, the end body every week. Every week for the eight weeks, we're going to get on the end body and we're going to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. And if you're off track or you're not getting results, we're going to change up your nutrition and, and make sure you're doing that, right? And then how do we reduce pain, effort, and sacrifice? Um, you know, obviously in this situation, that person needs to do more than what they're they're currently doing and they need accountability and because they're not being consistent. So how do we provide them, you know, the accountability, the support, the motivation so they actually do what they know they're supposed to do? It's leading with value, right? He's not just saying, hey, stick around for another eight weeks and let's hope something changes. It's saying, hey, let's work together over the next eight weeks and let's make a commitment, right? Like, hey, what's the goal? You know, if we lost 12 pounds or 14 pounds or 15 pounds in the next two months, would that be motivating, right? Like whatever that conversation looks like, obviously it's gotta be nuanced uh, to that person. But just because they not telling you that they don't have a goal. Like some people are like, oh, I, I, I don't want to bullshit. They're just suppressing it because they don't believe that they can achieve it. Or they've been with you guys long enough that, you know, just what they're currently doing isn't, isn't going to work. So there's no value. At some point, like people will stay for uh, the relationships and the community. Um, but sometimes what ends up happening, their friends leave or coaches change over or something feels different. And the value for them isn't there anymore. So you got to reestablish value with those those people. When we uh, changed the model of our gym, we also raised the price, which I would never, like knowing what I know now, don't do both. Don't change your model and increase the price at the same time. That's a recipe for pissing off a lot of people in a very short period of time. But what I told my team is we need to go back and reestablish a gap between where they're at, where they want to be, and how our product is going to be the solution to them getting where they need to be. Some of these clients have been here for three to five years and there hasn't been a goal conversation. So there is no gap. And when there is no gap, there is no solution to be able to provide enough value, right? So when we're having these conversations, we need to recreate a gap of where, there are, where they are and where they want to be and position what you're offering as the solution to get from A to B. And the only way we can do that to Dustin's point is have a conversation with somebody. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see is we're still in this game of make it super easy to cancel. You need to add friction. So one of the easiest ways to add friction is saying, hey, uh, you can even if you just have a 30 day notice saying, hey, you just have to come in during training hours and fill out a form. Dang. So they have to come in during training hours and tell somebody they actually care about versus just sending an email or a text message to some unknown person or administrative person that they don't give two shits about. Let's be real. But if they have to walk in during training hours, so they got to do it in front of their peers. And then they also have to like tell somebody 
uh, that they care about that I'm canceling, which now allows you to have a, a little bit of a pre-conversation with that person and try to avoid that that cancellation. But a big mistake too is they fill out the form and maybe it's 30 days and then your team has urgency on day 29 to try to have a conversation with that person. They've already left. They're gone. They've mentally quit because when somebody says, I want to quit outside of a financial emergency, that wasn't the first day they've thought about quitting. They've yeah. thought about quitting for three to four months and they finally have the courage or they finally got prompted in, in a way to to take action or their motivation was high enough. And just having them to have to come in is high enough friction. I'm the perfect example. If anyone's ever come to Domination Workshop, you know that across the street, one minute for me is a Planet Fitness. I can walk my butt to Planet Fitness right away. So I used to travel, like two or three years ago, I used to travel a lot. I had a Planet Fitness membership because pretty much I could find a gym anywhere in the country because they have a gym everywhere. And I have not canceled because it requires me walking in and saying, I want to fill it. I got to, I want to cancel. I need to fill out a form. And I'm just too fucking lazy to do it. So they've bought three, like two to three additional years of LTV from me. And my wife's always like, uh, when are you going to cancel that? Cause that's just a waste of money. And I'm like, I'll get to it. Right. So you're, you're buying additional months just by having them have to walk in and, and have a conversation with you and then training your team on how do we have an, a conversation with that person and can we prevent some cancellations, but then obviously um, escalating it to what Dustin's talking about with, with an exit interview. And the easiest way to have somebody do an exit interview is being able to say, hey, in order for me to process your cancellation request, I need to ask you a, a few questions or I need to ask you a few questions in order for me to process your cancellation request, right? So with that, that will get them on the phone or that will get them in person because if there's no reason for them to pick up that phone, they already know it's going to be awkward. They already know that you're probably going to try to convince them to stay. So why am I like going to do that? In order for me to process your cancellation request, I have to ask you a few questions or I have a few questions in order for me to process your cancellation request. That will actually get people on the phone because in order for them to get what they want, they have to do what what you want them to do. Um, and again, that should happen in the week one. If you do have an easy process, like you need to do that in week one because it's the same thing in the sales process on the front end with the trial. If you're trying to sell somebody in week four, they've already made up your mind. A lot of people try to schedule like one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions for the end of the trial and then they can't get anybody in no. because they've already made their decision. So it's the same thing in the cancellation process. Like you need to get in front of them as quick as humanly possible to avoid that, but add some friction. It, it's just, it's simple behavior change. If you want to make it easy, like if you want somebody to do something, remove the friction and make it as easy as possible to do what you want them to do. If you want to reduce something, you need to add friction in order for them to, to reduce it, right? So it's simple human behavior but it works. Love it. But yeah, I think the big thing I would just want to urge everyone here is, is like you got to create novelty in the program because when they're canceling, they've lost belief that the program works. And so it, it, they're thinking something new is going to do better. So if you can create new within your program, that it's going to be your program plus more accountability, your program plus more nutrition support, that's where you're building it in your program because otherwise they'll say, I, I think I'm going to go try this other app or device at home or the other gym so you have to create that because if you, you know to matt's point you just say just stick around longer just keep doing what you're doing that doesn't that it doesn't register in their mind it doesn't make sense right it's the definition of insanity so that's the main sections but just to bring this home guys the beginning revenue of the gym was right around twenty thousand, and when we wrapped up 13 months of doing all this rehab. Again, it was not overnight. I'm very impatient. That was something I had to learn through this. My vision was I was gonna flip it in six, six months. And so it took 13 months, but we damn near doubled it. We are at 39,600 was the sale of the top month and it was at 20. So it was like 400. I was like, even asking myself, I should just bought something for 400 bucks that month just so I could have got to that doubling quicker. 
but we almost doubled it to 40,000 in 13 months. So ask yourself, would you guys lock in and put in the effort to double your business in 12 months time? That is huge for most of the people listening to this call. And so it's knowing what to work on. We just gave it you, right? We gave you the five sections that you got to go back. And if you want to do it with Matt on a call, one-to-one, -one, go to gymaudit.com and book a call again, gymaudit.com. But it's basically going to be, we got to look at the coaching product. We got to look at your marketing and your trial flow. We got to look at your leadership and the culture that they're creating. We got to look at your onboarding. And then we got to look at your sales process and converting them to membership. And so those are the things that, you know, I did with this gym to double it. I'm excited to see where it's going to go from here because, you know, again, they were losing 10 K a month. Now they're making 6 K profit a month. And so that's what I'm excited for is just taking it to the another, another level. So final thing I'll just share with you guys that we're going to be adding in the future is small group training. Um, I'm not going to go into that. That's like a whole nother episode, but we're going to add that as a tier two service to the clients. And then um, we're going to be also adding in a new freeze policy where they get their frozen time added on the back end of their membership. And that's something we talk about at length with our mastermind members, but essentially like how to like completely set up your policy so that they work in your favor and set up your gym for success. So that is that in terms of the audit. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I know this was a very like, deep dive tactical episode if you guys enjoyed it tag me and matt on facebook or instagram let us know you liked it and again if you want to go through your own version of a gym audit just go to gymaudit.com and book a call with matt and he will be happy to do that with you for just one measly dollar so we'll see you guys next week later hey do you need a sales rep to take care of all of your lead follow-up well that is exactly what we do at gym reinforcements we plug a sales rep into your business to do all of the inbound and outbound lead nurture i'm talking text emails calls social media dms if you or one of your team members is needing to do that every single day and it is draining then it's time to head it off to me and my team so if you want to learn more go to gymreinforcements.com and we'll be happy to grow your business.